Hi guys, good day. My name is Kenyatta and I'm one of the pastors here at Harvest Bible Chapel in Turks and Caicos. I'm so glad that you took the time to join us today. At this time, why don't you go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Our brand new series right off the presses is called Blueprints. And what it is, is that it's a study... Um, in Matthew chapter 5 all the way to chapter 7 and we're calling it blueprints because uh, in these verses these two chapters uh, what we see is the blueprint for what kingdom living is like for those who are in the kingdom of God no I want to say this uh, we did a series a while back and we focused specifically on the Beatitudes. But now uh, we are moving on from the Beatitudes and we are talking about kingdom living. Now I want to say this. The main theme in the book of Matthew is about the kingdom of God. Right? Now, the kingdom of God is the rule or the reign of God. Think of this, a government where God is the ruler, right? So, to be in the kingdom of God is to be under the rule or the reign of Jesus Christ, who is the king in this kingdom. But there's more, and there's really good news. When you are in the kingdom of God, you are a recipient of all the blessings and all the privileges that comes with living under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus taught us about living in the kingdom of God, uh, he described a lifestyle that was completely different from this world. That means we are blessed differently. It means our attitudes are to be different. It means that the way we use our money should be different. It means that the way we go about acting and behaving towards one another should be different. Living in the kingdom of God is a completely different way of living, of living, sorry, from the kingdom of this world. So, uh, being different, however, as important as it is, it is not the goal of living in the kingdom of God. By living according to kingdom principles, we show everyone how amazingly generous and gracious and kind our King Jesus is. Why? So that they can desire to be in the kingdom and they can take steps to come under the rule of Jesus Christ and be recipients in the flow of blessings that come from being in the kingdom of God. So when you live according to kingdom principles, you are evangelizing for the king. You are evangelizing for Jesus himself. And what this series, Blueprint, and this sermon is going to do is that it is going to show us how to be a kingdom citizen. So why don't you go to the text right now, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, and I'm going to read. Uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on the people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, I want to highlight a few things for you. The kingdom of God is in direct and constant conflict with the kingdom of this world. There's opposition from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of heaven. And uh, if you're in the kingdom of heaven, you will uh, be persecuted by those who are in the kingdom of this world. The authentic kingdom person and the authentic kingdom church is so different from the world around it 
that the world does not and cannot tolerate it. Instead, it wants to destroy it. Now, look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. It's going to come up on the screen. Uh, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So watch this. As a man or woman in the kingdom of God, when you stand for Christ, when you stand and live according to kingdom principles, suffering will come opposition or persecution or whatever it is, it is going to come from those who are part of the kingdom of this world. So if you are a kingdom man and you are leading a kingdom life or you are a kingdom woman and, and you are leading a kingdom life, if as couples you are leading a, um, a kingdom marriage or a kingdom family, do not expect adulation or awards or applause. Instead, from the world, expect this. Suffering from those who are under the rule of the kingdom of this world. Now, there's one aspect of the warfare that has been waged against you and I that I want to highlight for our awareness and action. First thing I want to say is this. I do not, and I encourage you to join me in this belief, I do not believe that this coronavirus was started by the devil. I think that a groaning fallen natural world is more than sufficient to throw up storms and floods and viruses our way. Secondly, I do not believe every response to this virus by governments or medical fields, um, by those in the medical fields, sorry, was influenced by the devil either. Maybe some have been, but not all for sure. But here's what I believe. And I firmly believe this, that the enemy has used a lot that is happening in this season to wreak havoc against and within the church. And over the last few weeks, get this right, because we're going to see how this plays out. Over the last few weeks here in the TCI, our uh, positive numbers have been plummeting as have the numbers of new cases. Now, let me ask you this. Did your anxiety that came when we were in triple-digit territory go down with the decreasing numbers? Do you feel less afraid now? Because when you look to the dashboard, it's, um, those numbers are going down. Let me guess for you. The answer is no. Do you know why? Because somewhere along the line, the main thing stopped being about hygiene and good health. And the main thing was the enemy attacking us through fear. It was the enemy attacking us through mental overload. It was the enemy attacking us and bombarding us through distress. And here's the thing. If tomorrow it was said by all the media houses, Fox and CNN and BBC and all the media houses came together and agreed and said this, the virus has disappeared. Let me tell you what's going to remain. The scars of fear will remain. The enemy has been bombarding the church and the kingdom of God with fear during this season. But here's how the virus of fear will be cured. Flood your mind. Flood your affections with the truth of God's word and praise in response to God's power and might. Only then would this cloud of fear disappear and the sun, S-O-N, will shine true again in your heart and in your mind. Let me pray for us right now. Lord, I pray for those who have been under the enemy's attacks on their mind. Father, lead them to your word and to open their mouths in praises to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now, here's the other thing I want you to note about this passage. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And then he says, you are the light of the world. Jesus is not calling everyone in the world to be salt and light. That is reserved specifically for those who are in the kingdom of God. So when Jesus says, you are, he's not saying that he wishes we were salt and light, nor is he saying that we need to work hard to be salt and light. He's saying we are already salt and light in this world. If we live in the kingdom of God, we are already salt and light to this world. And that is why the title for today's sermon is You Are an Influencer. As a card-carrying member of the kingdom of God, you are already an influencer in this world. So loved ones, you need to begin to live like that if you are not already. Now you may be thinking, wait, me? An influencer? Nah. I don't have degrees, I don't have a business, I'm not an athlete, I'm not a musician. So there's no way that I am called to be an influencer in this society. Let me read something for you that was said by a Bible commentator. What lasting good can the poor and the meek do? The mourners and the merciful and those who try to make peace, not war. Would they not simply be overwhelmed by the flood tide of evil? What can they accomplish whose only passion is an appetite for righteousness and whose only weapon is purity of heart? Are not such people too feeble to achieve anything, especially if, that, if they are a small minority in the world? So Jesus in saying you are salt and you are the light, his immediate audience was a bunch of peasants and fishermen. And he called them to penetrate and influence the world of their day. And the way they were to do it was by being men and women whose lives were different because they were called to walk to a different drumbeat and they served a different king than the world served. It is our very distinctiveness, not our size, not our political clout, not our financial resources. It is our distinctiveness, forgiving when we are wronged, loving when we are hated and cursed, and not our conformity that influences the world around us. So I want to say this again, right? I want to say this again because I want you to hear this. We do not influence the world because we are rich. We do not influence the world because we have the greatest communicators in the church. We do not influence the world because we have the best digital platforms. We do not influence the world because we have uh, the best cutting edge uh, human resource principles. And we certainly do not influence the world by conforming and copying what the world is doing. We influence the world when we are distinctive, when we are different, when we act different. And that's how a bunch of peasants and fishermen, a bunch of men and women in a dusty little tongue, in a dusty small nation over 2,000 years ago changed the world because they were distinctive and they were serving a mighty king. So write this down now. This is our first point. Write this down. Keep the good. Now, in Jesus' day, as in ours, Saul did two primary things. It preserved, so think of meat or fish being kept from going bad uh, because they were salted. And salt also seasoned by adding flavor. So the church, as the salt of the earth, is called to prevent the world from going bad and evil from spreading throughout society. And the same applies to every member of the body of Jesus Christ. 
Furthermore, uh, we are called as salt to bring healing and restoration and joy to those who make up the body of Christ. So we are to preserve and we are to flavor the world around us. And here's how we do that. So write this down to this is, um, uh, point number one under point number one. Write this down. Song the alarm. No, if you are in a building and a fire starts in the lunchroom while you are there, what are you going to do? I could tell you, you pull the alarm. You pull the fire alarm. And you don't even think about it. You just do it. If you see a fire, you make some noise and you get everybody out of the building and you call the fire station. So when you see evil around you, what do you do? Are you outspoken against evil? Do you condemn it for what it is? That's what Saul does. That's what the church is called to do. That's what you and I are called to do, to sound the alarm when we see evil in our world. Now, when we use biblical lens to see the world, when we preach the truths of Scripture without apology, there's going to be equal measures of proclamation and denunciation. In speaking truth, we have to point out the evils in our society. That means we have to say that illegal border crossing human trafficking is wrong. We have to say that worker exploitation is wrong. And in the same breath, we have to say uh, stealing your employer's time is wrong. We keep the good in society when we sung the alarm about the evil that is in society. In addition to sounding the alarm, we are to cultivate what is good. Now, because of God's common grace, are there some pretty good things happening in your neighborhood or your profession or your country? And they're not necessarily happening because Christians are doing them. Common grace allows for good things to happen that are being done by people who are not necessarily in the kingdom of God. But here's what I want to say to you. Whenever and wherever you see good being done, help it, support it. Now, as a Christian, I want to say this. We are very pro-government. Not pro-party. Don't confuse that. We are pro-government. Okay? Now, we know that the governing machinery was put in place by God to prevent society from slipping into chaos. So a few weeks ago at church, uh, we had a police officer visit uh, to make sure that we were within the government-mandated figure of 25 persons in church. Were we upset? Did we complain? No, we were pleased. Why? Because when the police do their job, we are all safer as a result. And seeing him, this particular officer, doing his job made all of us feel better. Now, we didn't get his name or his number, but I want to say this. Uh, he was very courteous. He was very respectful. And he was a very good representative of the police force here. So if you are watching this officer... <laughs> Come again, we love to have you. Now I want to say this, uh, we are also pro-family. And like the government, the family institution is designed to bring order and structure to society. When the family unit is strong and healthy, society, the fabric of society is strong and healthy for the most part. So we try to do at least two marriage events per year here at Harvest in the TCI because we want to see stronger marriages. Uh, there are 24 couples whose names are up on a board in my office that I pray for regularly because I want their marriages to be strong. We do premarital and marriage counseling, and we do that because we want to see marriages that are strong. No, because the government and the family keep society from evil, we support them. Cultivating the good takes other forms. 
uh, we can start or help to start initiatives that put justice-oriented structures in place, such as a rescue mission or a food distribution program or laws protecting the rights of minors. Uh, the other thing we can do is to support the good that is already being done in society. Let me give you an example. The Ed Gartland Youth Center is doing a phenomenal job in the TCI, and because of that, we need to support it. And I'm so pleased to see so many of those who call Harvest their home church volunteering their time and their services to the youth center. And my encouragement, keep it up. And to others who have not yet jumped in, I want to say this. Help the youth of our nation to be better. I want to tell you about this young man at our church. And he drives around with a garbage bag and a pair of gloves in his car. Now, I was writing this down, and now that I'm saying it, it sounds very weird, and it sounds very different to when I was writing this down. So I really hope that the police don't pull him aside and search his trunk and see a garbage bag and a pair of gloves, right? They're going to think something else. Anyway, seriously, why does he do this? He's not an axe murderer or anything. So why does he walk around with a, a, a garbage bag and a bunch of gloves in his car? You know why? Because when and wherever he sees garbage, he stops and he picks it up and he puts it in this garbage bag. Could you imagine that? No, that's just one man. But through his efforts, his small group is now picking up garbage on a regular day wherever they see it. So that's why I want to say this. When you see good happening, support the good. Now here's the other thing I want you to write down. Spread the news. First point, keep the good. Second point, spread the news. Social commentary and social structures are good but they do not change the heart of men. We influence society by preserving and enhancing what is good while condemning the evil, but we transform society by preaching the gospel which changes the hearts and destinies of men. Loved ones, your home, your workplace, your community, your country need social structures that are godly. But more than that, they need the gospel because only the gospel brings lasting change. Does any one of us need to be told how morally corrupt our world is? Now, when you add the foolishness that portrays itself as the church in some places, there's only one conclusion, and it's this. Our world is in a fog of moral and spiritual darkness. And that is why we need the light to navigate our way through this world. Darkness cannot coexist where light is. Uh, light a candle in a dark room, and what happens? The darkness recedes. And the light of one church, the light of one believer, can bring clarity and hope and direction to a nation and a family. So the church and its members, according to Jesus, is the light of the world. And we shine that light when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is himself, according to John 9, 5, the light. Now, I'm old enough now to understand that some people's response to you is not because of how you look. It's not because of how you dress. And it's not because of where you live. But some people will respond to you in a certain way because of the light that is in you and because of the light that you are shining when you are living by kingdom principles and you are talking about the king of the kingdom and that light convicts them and that light drives them insane and that's why they oppose you and they curse you and they come against you now you can't be friends with everyone but shine your light and let the chips fall where they fall
No, spreading the good news is critical in a world of darkness. Because as light illuminates, the gospel shows people the way of salvation. And man has looked to everything to fill the hole in his heart and to release him from the sting of sin, only to find that nothing works. And I want to say this to you. If you have been trying everything, to fill that hole that is in your heart. And everything has come up short. I want to say to you, there's something that works. And that is Jesus Christ. And when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, it works because it, set, it sets men and women free. Now, loved ones, we need to spread it. Because of the power of the gospel, we need to spread it. And yes, there are people who hate the light. And yes, there are people who would reject the light. And yes, there are people who love the darkness. It's like when you're home, right, and the uh, uh, room is dark, and you shine that light, and you um, have all these uh, insects, they, they scurry to the darkness. And there are some people that prefer darkness because their works are dark than light. But that should not stop us from telling them, about Jesus Christ, who is the light of mankind. Now, I don't say this lightly. But the church is the only hope for this nation. The church is the only hope for your nation. When Jesus compares the light of the church and the light of the believer to a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, He's saying that in a world covered in spiritual darkness, the church becomes a refuge for those searching for true life. Now, as much as I love the church, I have to say this, right? I have to say this. Uh, we, the church, are responsible for some of the things that we are seeing in society. And that sounds harsh. But when we neglect truth in order to peddle a party line or personal preferences, we are not serving our community. When we act unbiblically towards one another, we do a disservice to the watching world. And when we dabble in the occult and masquerade it as being spiritually enlightened, we cover ourselves in the cloak of deception and we lead others astray also. So we have to take some of the responsibility. Now, our motive for spreading the light of the gospel is not that we may be seen. It's not that our names will be up in light, but that others may see and they may give glory to God. God is glorified when we spread the gospel. He's glorified when we make much of him. And because of this great responsibility, Jesus gives us two warnings that we need to take to heart in this passage. And now, they're right in the text. It says, if salt has lost its taste, goes on to say that it's useless. And then the, the, the other warning is this. People do not light a lamp and put it on their basket. So, if as citizens of the kingdom of God, we cease to be different and we begin copying the world around us, we would not be able to advance the kingdom of God. If we conform and lose our distinctiveness, we are not going to be able to influence the world to righteousness and holiness. Now the same applies to preaching. If we water down the gospel, if we culturally couch it so that it becomes more palatable to others, if we begin to proclaim our thoughts and our opinions, or we begin to preach another gospel, then we lose the ability and the power to direct men and women to the true kingdom of God. Some churches and believers can be like a well that people go to for drink and for sustenance, only to find that it is empty. Or worse yet, it only gives off or gives out poisonous water. Loved ones, we are called to be influencers in this world. 
So let's take that task seriously and let's be the salt and the light that God has made us to be and that the world needs. They may not want us, but we are the influencers that this nation needs right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this word. I know parts of it were difficult, but I pray that your spirit will take this word and your spirit will bring conviction and your spirit will bring transformation to those who are hearing this. Father, you have already called us those who are in your kingdom, salt and light. You have already called us to be influencers. Give us the courage and give us the strength to be what you have already called us to be. Bless your people. Bless your kingdom servants. In Jesus' name, amen.